give it two seconds. Make sure I'm recording and yeah, good to go. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks so much. So hi, everybody. Um, I've had the pleasure of meeting everybody on the call today. Um, but yes, I'm Kristen Ferguson. Uh, for those who might be watching the recording, I'm Kristen Ferguson, uh, Program Director for the Large Landscapes Program at the Nature Conservancy of Canada. And I work specifically in the Ontario region. Um, so thank you so much for the opportunity to present um, about some potential opportunities for conservation and collaboration. Um, presenting primarily to uh, three communities in northeastern Ontario today, uh, Chaplo Cree First Nation, Missinabe Cree First Nation, and Brunswick Coast First Nation, who I understand may join us as we go. Um, but also I'm excited to know this webinar will be recorded and potentially shared out with other communities in the area. Um, lots of exciting conservation potential and the Nature Conservancy of Canada is just really excited to share and start some of these conversations about how we might work together going forward. So I've got um, just a bit of an agenda for us today. Uh, the presentation should be about a half hour or so. Um, and I did just wanna encourage people, they can certainly ask questions as we go. I can see if you raise your hand and uh, it's always good if something needs clarification, if you're thinking it, somebody else probably is as well. So feel free. Um, so today we'll walk through uh, who is the Nature Conservancy of Canada or NCC as we typically go by, cause our name is a mouthful. We'll talk a bit about our Boreal Wildlands recent conservation project and then spend some time talking about support for Indigenous led conservation and, and this whole exciting area of work and then leaving time at the end for some questions and discussion. So who is the Nature Conservancy of Canada? Well, let me just stress, we're not the government, even though our name sounds like that. That's one of the most common questions I get. So we're actually a large non-profit environmental charity, um, but we are Canada's leading land conservation organization. We've been around since 1962, and I would say that our focus is really on habitat conservation. So for me, that means protecting whole habitats, protecting the forests, the wetlands, the rivers, and everything that can be found within those systems from the species at risk, to the medicinal or culturally important plants, to the mycorrhizae in the soil, uh, really the whole ecosystem. Once you protect the habitat, you protect everything in it, and that's what gets us really excited. In addition, we're excited about people in nature and that connection between people and nature and understanding that conservation um, just doesn't happen as well without people closely involved and that people deeply benefit from nature and conservation. So um, rather than seeing conservation as we protected this and drew a line around it or put a fence around it and then people are here and nature is here, it's about the interconnectedness of the two. And that's really think how we have success in this area. And just wanted to flag that NCC is a non-advocacy and non-activist organization. So while we may have feelings about things uh, that government or industry are uh, are doing. NCC's stance is typically a neutral one where we can certainly have important conversations with these types of partners, uh, but you won't find us kind of with a headline on the front page of the newspaper speaking out against these groups. We try and find more the constructive um, solutions, the places of overlap and the places that enable us to work together to get great things done on the land. So a few facts about NCC. Um, we've been around since 1962, as I mentioned. So in over 60 years, we've helped conserve over 15 million hectares, which is about 38 million acres, if you think in acres. And if you don't think in any of those things, because I can't picture what that looks like, it's actually five times the size of Vancouver Island. I found this stat. And so I can actually picture that in my head that's been protected or conserved um, since 1962. And I learned that that's a rate of about uh, 4,300 NHL hockey rinks per day since 1962 when we got started. And as a Toronto Maple Leafs fan, I like that stat because I can picture that too. And that's a heck of a lot of land protected. We're really proud of that. A lot of those um, have actually just been NCC supporting other partners, governments, or Indigenous communities to um, achieve great conservation. Though lots of it has been us directly protecting land, and I'll talk more about how we do that in a minute. We're really proud of the fact that in all those conservation projects, we've protected habitat for 244 species at risk. So um, it's nice to know that we've helped protect their homes. 
We're proud of the fact that we have 12 very well established partnership projects with Indigenous communities across Canada and countless more in various stages of development. And that would be how I classify some of the things that we're working on together, sort of in those early days of, of seeing where great projects can go when we work in collaboration. Across the bottom of this slide, you'll see a few of our key values and just wanted to touch on the fact that we are really committed to bringing the best available, both science and knowledge. So um, really emphasizing like a two-eyed seeing approach to using that sort of evidence in our conservation decision-making. We try to act with respect, integrity, and really focus on the principles of collaboration and cooperation, uh, recognizing that nature is for everybody and there's certainly no one right way to get nature protected and conserved. I'll show a map. Um, this is uh, recent up to 2020, which flagged for me, I really need a new map. I drew one of the dots on myself today. Um, you might be able to tell which one. Um, but you can see that uh, a lot of our projects, um, so NCC-led projects are in yellow, and the ones where we helped partners are in orange, really focused a lot on southern Canada. This is where we've been doing the bulk of our work. This is where the most people live, so the threats of habitat conversion, habitat loss, tend to be a, more acute. And there's also more um, sort of richness of biodiversity in that we have species that can only live at certain southern climates. So you have that sort of intersection of high threat, high biodiversity. So we need to keep working in the south. But as we work towards supporting reaching 20 or 30 percent of lands and waters protected by 2030, we need to do more and bigger and across more of this great big country. Um, so you can see my slightly large yellow dot <laughs> that I just put in the Hearst area for a project that I'll talk about next that we completed in 2022. But there's so much opportunity to move conservation and move the needle in a big way and the way NCC works um, further up through the northern parts of the country. And I see most of those projects as ideally being Indigenous led or having a strong component of Indigenous um, input and insight uh, and, and leadership. So some of the conservation tools that NCC can use, so I picture myself having a tool belt and I always just had these two tools in it. I've been at this um, uh, land conservation directly type of work for about a decade. My tool belt always had two tools in it and now I'm getting more and more tools to add to the belt and that's pretty exciting. So one of our traditional tools is the conservation of private lands. And I've shared with some of you already that I'm, I have some level of discomfort with this term because of how lands came to be in private ownership in our system. However, that is the system we're working in today where individuals and organizations can own lands. And so typically NCC has dealt in the area of accepting donations of those lands. So if a landowner says, did you want me to give you my 100 acres of wetland? We say, yes, please. Or as we've grown, the ability to actually go out to landowners and purchase land. So we might say, hey, we really like your thousand acres of forest, could we potentially buy it? And so those are the transactions that have really been at the, the heart of what we've been doing, but we're definitely sort of turning turning a corner in, in where we're going. Um, and so that along with placing conservation easements, which is like an agreement on private lands where an, a landowner will manage it, similar to how we would manage it for conservation. Now the tool belt starts to grow. So supporting Indigenous-led conservation, IPCAs, I'll talk more about um, in uh, a couple of sections from now. This is a tool I'm, I'm really, really excited that NCC will have a chance to use. And also influencing conservation on public lands. So this has happened in other provinces with some of my other colleagues, uh, not here in Ontario yet, but actually acquiring rights and tenures like forestry licenses or mining tenures. NCC has worked with like governments and industry to actually acquire some of those, sort of enabling then conservation to occur on the public land base, which is which is interesting and maybe a component of potentially future IPCA. So I can see how some of these tools might blend together. And also um, OECMs is another tool in the belt. You guys may have heard this acronym. I, I, it's not my favorite. That's a lot of vowels, but it means other effective area-based conservation measures, which essentially you can think of as conservation where conservation wasn't the purpose, 
but conservation is happening. So my favorite example is like an army base. And this is actually an example. There's one that's been, there's an OECM out in Manitoba. That's the Shiloh military base where I don't know the numbers, but perhaps in the middle 200 hectares, they're, you know, exploding ordnance. <laughs> and then in the 10,000 acres around that, they are making sure that no humans get exploded by said ordnance. So then those 10,000 acres actually get counted as conservation because they're providing habitat for species and clean drinking water and that sort of thing. So that's OECMs in a nutshell. Just another tool that we may consider about where is conservation happening, where we can count it, um, even though conservation wasn't the primary intention. So just a few of the, few of the tools in my tool belt, uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions about those um, at the end of the presentation too. And so next I wanted to talk about the Boreal Wildlands Project. That's this project that always lives behind me on my team's background uh, and also in my heart. This is a really special place and I really see the opportunity here to collaborate with local First Nations such as yourselves um, uh, on making sure that we continue to, to care for this place over the long term so it has the best possible outcomes for people and for nature. I wish that I could take you guys there, but in the absence of doing that, I thought I'd take you there with a couple of pictures. So we had a drone go over the site uh, when it was its most beautiful, when the, the poplars um, and birch were turning color last September. And so you can see the properties full of forests and lakes, rivers and wetlands. I will mention this land was formerly owned by Domtar, a forestry company, though they hadn't harvested it they hadn't harvested the forests in about 15 years, so they're in quite a state of like return and rebound. And it's pretty darn nice and natural and gorgeous out there. And it, we're we're really excited to have had the chance to put this place aside from um, future industrial development. And you can just see some more shots of it. So I hope those pictures make you smile the same way they make me smile, because I think we all share a real love for this incredible landscape that is the boreal forest. So to put that on a map for you all, this is where the, the what we call the Boreal Wildlands property is located, just south and southwest of Hearst. Uh, some of the notable features on that landscape would be the Missinabe River running uh, east of the site. So it, the site is everything in those orange blocks. It's kind of in three pieces. And then Nagagamesis Provincial Park and Highway 11, you can see on the map running east to west. And also that sort of yellowish blob is the clay belt, the Great Northern Clay Belt. So that big ecological feature that sits on the landscape. I guess it's a geological feature in that it's the former lake bed of um, Glacial Lake Ojibwe and therefore is quite um, clayey and low and flat and holds a lot of water. And as a result, this property is actually almost 50% wetland. And I'm a big fan of uh, peatlands and all the amazing things that happen in them. So that's a pretty exciting one to us. One thing we know about the clay belt is that it's a special part of the boreal forest in that it actually would be hospitable to growing um, crops and um, conducting agriculture. If you look across the border uh, with Quebec in the clay belt, you can actually see that um, government subsidies in that province have a, enabled people to um, subdivide and clear and drain this same geography, so boreal forest, and turn it into farmland. So we we're concerned about that threat in this part, and we've heard that from a number of partners as well. Um, so again, happy that we were able to have protected this place um, so that that threat at least um, is mitigated. Some stats on the property, it's about 350,000 acres or 147,000 hectares. And if you can't picture that, don't worry, I can't either. It's actually two times the size of the whole footprint of the city of Toronto. So I think about that sometimes when I'm driving from like Etobicoke across to Scarborough and I'm frustrated in rush hour traffic, I think, huh, all of this and all the way down to Lake Ontario is fully protected. And then it's protected all over again. It's pretty cool. Um, so NCC successfully conserved this beautiful place in August of 2022. And as I mentioned, some amazing forests and wetlands and rivers. But also um, one interesting feature that is there that we we weren't totally sure about when we were completing the conservation on the project, um, but came to light as we went through the, the project is caribou. We're right on the edge of the caribou range and there's a known range that's 
in and around the Nagagamesis Provincial Park area. And there have actually been um, what we think are caribou prints observed like in the winter on the Boreal Wildlands property. Um, so we uh, are working with um, Constance Lake First Nation on a wildlife camera setup and analysis to determine if there are caribou using the site and then asking, and how can we improve that habitat for them knowing they're such an important species and a species at risk. Um, and then our vision really is just working together to, to care for the space with other people who are aligned, who care about this area too. Um, and I'll just mention that um, we have had a name, a potential Cree name proposed for the site, uh, which is Aski Kamenachit Katsak, meaning saving our earth or saving our land, which um, we hope to be able to kind of officially uh, name the site with um, in the in the coming months or years, because um, that, that would be really special for us. And we can thank our friends at Constance Lake First Nation for coming up with that. So just a few more shots from the site and actually most of the pictures and most of my presentations are from Boreal Wildlands because it is just kind of amazing. It's pretty next level special um, and it's a new landscape to work in for me. So I think I'm extra excited about it, but I mean, with the big mammals, you can see a baby lynx up in a tree that somebody snapped while on the property and some of those crazy shoreline colors, just this place sort of just takes your breath away and it's really special. And I hope I get to bring you guys there uh, someday to see it in person. So right now, NCC has finished the conservation, like the, the securement or acquisition of the site, and we've moved into the phase of uh, property stewardship or caring for the lands. So that means ongoing engagement with local governments, both First Nation governments, um, as well as First Nation staff, such as yourselves, uh, and groups like the town of Hearst. We're also working with a variety of um, industries on uh, engaging about the site. So we have a good relationship with Hearst Forest Management Inc, who I know a number of you would have been in touch with. Um, and they are helping us think through what a forest management plan for the site would look like. Cause we're not gonna do any commercial harvesting, but we also know boreal forest systems are dynamic. We don't want the entire thing to burn to the ground if it's left for too long. Cause we know that was sort of the natural dynamic for these forests. So how do we, thin the forest or tend to the forest or do other landscape management techniques that will help the forest be its healthiest in its healthiest state for the long term. And we would certainly welcome any insights on that from yourselves uh, or others who may have that kind of expertise in your communities. Um, I put that little red star there because we're also working um, with engaging with the mining industry. When we first bought the property, there weren't any mining claims on it. There didn't seem to be any active interest in mining. And so we assess that as a low risk because we just acquired the surface rights, not the subsurface rights. Um, and then, of course, as soon as we bought it, something is in the air and everybody's staking claims all over the place, including on this property. So we've been actively engaging with the claimants there just to talk about how important this place is for conservation. Um, and again, I would certainly welcome thoughts on, on that area. Um, we have created our first property management plan for the site. This is an adaptive plan open to insight anytime. So if anybody ever wants to read a 100 page document and then tell us what we could be doing differently, we would love to hear it actually. We wanna make sure we're managing this site for all the values that are out there, not just the things that um, we may know through Western science, but um, any cultural values we should be aware of or different sorts of steps we should be taking to manage the property well. Um, that's always an open invitation. Uh, we'll be exploring some restoration opportunities. So in places where the forests were perhaps not as, excuse me, sustainably cut, there may be opportunities for tree planting or other sorts of site management. So we're looking into that. And I, as I'm saying it, I was thinking that could be a neat um, potential guardians opportunity or something like that. And we're also developing a carbon finance project on the site, which I'll chat about on the next slide. So, um, because the site is going to remain in natural cover and all these trees behind me are going to be there forever or for some iteration of forever, um, because we're not doing any commercial forestry or forest clearing, it's called avoided conversion. And because of that, it means that carbon will be stored in the trees on the site for the long term. And therefore that carbon can actually be monetized and sold on the stock market. 
I'm still wrapping my head around a lot of these concepts. Um, there's a whole team at NCC responsible for carbon projects. That isn't me, but it is an interesting opportunity um, to sort of acknowledge the carbon storage role that these properties are playing. Um, and we would be thrilled to do kind of like a 101 carbon presentation. And when I say we, I mean the carbon team at NCC, who I think has given me more one on 101 presentations than I can count. Um, but yeah, we'd be happy to provide something like that to your to you guys or to your communities um, if there's interest. And NCC is going to be reaching out um, that team as well in I think early May um, via David to talk more about some of the opportunities related to developing this carbon project uh, on this property. So some possible next steps. Um, we I've chatted with a few of you a few different times about actually getting out to the site this spring, summer, fall, perhaps. Um, it's always so nice to get out on the land together. I think that's, um, it just provides such, I don't know, it's fun, there's clarity, and there's a chance to just be in nature together. And I think the ideas that come out of that are often different than ones that might come out of a team screen. So um, really would invite anybody anytime to let me know if you'd like a tour of the place, it would be my pleasure to give you one. And I'd love to hear more about how your communities may like to use this particular piece of land. We've had a couple of discussions. Um, uh, Lisa, who doesn't look like is here um, from Brunswick House First Nation had suggested looking at some of the historical places people from her community had passed through this area and perhaps putting up um, plaques or signage to acknowledge that. And we loved that idea. Um, are there ways that we can make harvesting, like visiting the property for hunting, uh, easier or more accessible for people? Are there opportunities to connect youth to the land out here? We're an open book, excited to hear all ideas, and we would love to support any of them if this property can be of benefit for those sorts of things. Um, we had chatted on our last call and a little bit with David here and there about um, potentially developing MOUs between NCC and the various communities. So would that be our leaders meeting your leaders, perhaps, um, and talking about establishing something more formal about how we might work together, if that's of benefit uh, to you guys. I'm also happy to keep things um, uh, more on the casual side and just want to stress we're, we're here forever. We're in the forever game. So I know how busy everybody is. And if the timing isn't right now, it's OK and we'll be here and we're always happy to kind of pick up that conversation. Um, and I also wanted to flag any time spent with NCC engaging about this initiative. We certainly want to support that appropriately with honoraria, recognizing how important everybody's valuable time is. And I would love to get advice from any of you about the mining interest in the site and any creative ideas about um, how I might address that, because I'm sure you have dealt with all of this in your territory for some time. And it's kind of new and scary to me, um, though it's been interesting having the conversations with claimants directly. A lot of them, when they hear it's conservation, sort of go, oh, I'm going to pack up shop. But yeah, I'd love to get your thoughts on that, too. And then I will just spend the rest of my presentation talking about supporting Indigenous-led conservation. So when Isabel and I were talking about putting together this presentation, I said, is it really appropriate for a white settler to be talking about Indigenous led conservation? How do I do this in a good way? And um, I really appreciated her support. Um, and I actually I found a way that I am most comfortable talking about this, which is borrowing words that were beautifully written in the uh, We Rise Together report from the Indigenous Circle of Experts that was published in 2018. It reminded me how excited I was when I first read that document about the ways that NCC could support Indigenous-led conservation. So that's actually where a lot of these great ideas are going to come from. Um, so at NCC, I mentioned we have a lot of um, established partnerships across the country and many more in various phases of being established. But our key guiding principle is building long-term, meaningful, and respectful relationships with Indigenous peoples. This is how we're going to move conservation forward. It has to be together. It has to be respectful and on the timelines of the people that we want to be engaging with about it. I think those relationships um, are working because they are grounded in this mutual respect and this love that we both share for the land. And I think um, that will take us a long way for sure. Um, NCC believes we can use our capacity, expertise, influence, maybe that's those friendly relationships we have with government um, to support Indigenous-led conservation projects, be an ally, be a partner in joint initiatives. 
And it's our goal to keep expanding our understanding of the land and how lands are managed and continue learning through Indigenous knowledge and history and, and all the uh, values and invaluable knowledge um, that's held um, within within your your minds and hearts and those of those in your communities too. So this is that report I mentioned, We Rise Together. I'm sure many of you have seen it. And if you haven't, uh, it's available online and I'd highly recommend skimming through it from time to time. It really is quite full of hope. Um, so inspired by this document, NCC evaluated our approach to conservation and kind of, I guess I describe it as began almost sort of turning a corner. So I mentioned our, our historical work was a lot about conservation of private lands and you know accepting donations or purchasing lands and we may continue to do that but conservation is changing and ncc recognizes the importance of supporting indigenous led conservation this is a time where um that that voice is getting louder and more empowered and people are listening and wanting to see um tangible indigenous led efforts on the ground and so that's i think it's time for ncc to sort of take that step, important step back and play a more supportive role of conservation uh, efforts going forward. It's a new way of working for us, newer, um, especially in Ontario, very new uh, for me. Sorry, if you can hear my dog's uh, toenails on the floor. He's laying down now. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, we have a lot to learn. So I appreciate your, your patience and uh, the continued guidance that um, everyone has provided. So a few excerpts from the We Rise Together document. Um, IPCA or Indigenous Protected and Conserved Area was a term chosen by the Indigenous Circle of Experts that described really a variety of land protection initiatives. Some examples that the report cites are tribal parks, Indigenous cultural landscapes, Indigenous protected areas or, and or Indigenous conserved areas. IPCAs are lands and waters where Indigenous governments have the primary role in conserving ecosystems based on Indigenous laws and knowledge and governance systems. And I loved that when I read that culture and language are the heart and soul of an IPCA. So IPCAs, again, Indigenous Protected and Conserved Areas, uh, generally share three key elements. They're Indigenous-led, that, that one I like, no brainer. Uh, they represent a long-term commitment to conservation. So to that landscape remaining the way it is, protecting that habitat, having all of those species and other cultural values persist for the long-term. And importantly, they elevate indigenous rights and responsibilities and put those right at the forefront. So in the Canadian context, and my apologies, this is a lot of words, there were a lot of really important words in here, so just bear with me. <laughs> IPCAs represent here in Canada a modern application of traditional values, laws, and knowledge systems, an exercise in cultural continuity on the land and water, a foundation for local Indigenous economies, which I thought was really important and exciting to highlight that conservation can be yeah, a source of uh, potential um, conservation finance through a variety of means, even if that's recognizing protected areas over here, areas that are okay for development over here, and sort of balancing those uses on the landscape. Um, but yeah, certainly uh, conservation uh, can go hand in hand with sort of a thriving um, economic outcome. I like that IPCs are opportunities to um, reconnect to the land and this idea that it would then heal both the land and heal the people through making that connection. And that uh, this is an acknowledgement of in, in all sorts of different international laws like the treaties, like UNDRIP, the Convention on Biological Diversity, and a number of other instru um, uh, instruments and commitments. And really, IPCAs can be an opportunity for true reconciliation to take place between Indigenous and settler societies, and they are truly an innovative expression of Section 35. So NCC's commitment, and I'll make it today, and I'm, I keep making it, and I'm very excited about it, happy to share our technical skills and expertise that we've gained in areas like conservation planning or prioritizing areas for protection on a landscape um, wherever invited and that's really key we're only there if we're invited to do so um, to support indigenous-led conservation so that may be establishing ipcas for example 
largely to advance reconciliation through conservation. And I was uh, brainstorming with some colleagues about ways that NCC might support Indigenous led conservation. So maybe you can um, sort of take these away with you and think about if any of these would be helpful resources that we could provide. Um, and uh, and feel free to get back to me anytime. So I think NCC can play a role in exploring options related to land title and land management. I've mentioned we as an organization like own a lot of private lands, if you'll bear with me with the terminology, and perhaps there are ways that we could uh, innovate around that. Um, could there be shared title opportunities, a transfer of title in the future? We could certainly look at um, uh, passing along man land management and stewardship responsibilities, uh, or also doing sort of co-management models um, where, where sort of Indigenous knowledge and NCC's knowledge are blended together on the landscape. Um, if there are barriers to Indigenous communities, say, owning land or the resources to manage that land, maybe that's a way that NCC could help. Uh, certainly with technical support, um, I've mentioned before, we're conservation science and planning nerds, myself included. Um, that was how I started at NCC 15 years ago, doing landscape level planning, mostly across those southern Ontario landscapes, but really gave me a taste for sort of prioritizing and choosing the best areas on the landscape to focus conservation initiatives on. Um, so definitely something we can lend. Uh, we can support um government relations because we do have that sort of non-advocacy position governments tend to like uh chatting with us and um we can have real conversations to learn about barriers opportunities etc and then be able to be a bit of a conduit if that's helpful um between various branches of provincial and federal government um, and our indigenous partners NCC, we're really um, focused on fundraising. I think about 15 or 20 percent of our organization staff are just like fundraising all the time to bring in big dollars from individuals, foundations, corporations, and even governments to support our conservation work. So we're hearing from a lot of donors that they would like to support Indigenous communities directly. So could we be a matchmaker or part of a project where then we could be a conduit for some of that funding? Um, I think there's huge opportunities there. So that may be something to keep in mind. Um, and then we have a bunch of unique kind of funding mechanisms and fund structures. Like for the Boreal Wildlands property, we have this fund called our Stewardship Endowment Fund, which is a lot of words just to say a big chunk of money that generates interest every year and we use that interest to pay for caring for the land so that supports staff it allows us to do things like pay property taxes um, and so we have a bunch of great financial folks um, advising us on how to set up these funding structures and then that's sort of advice that we'd be thrilled to pass along if that sounds like it could be helpful um, and then this model of um, actually creating indigenous land trust it's something i know is happening here and there across canada there was a recent example, I believe, in Nova Scotia, um, where an Indigenous land trust is being formed. So they can then actually just um, have title to those lands and take in lands that may be transferred from other conservation organizations or directly from landowners. And because NCC is technically a land trust, meaning just an organization that can hold land for the purpose of conserving it for the long term, we've got a lot of expertise in the sort of governance of land trust so that may be something we can we can bring to the table as well in terms of support so some ideas and then i ran out of room on the slides i have more um and then i'd love to always hear from you guys about what resources may be helpful or um maybe in shorter supply that we can talk about how ncc could play a role in, in bringing them to the table and i'll just wrap up today with um a, a case study and so this case study was um, provided to me by a couple of my colleagues um, who worked supporting the Cree Nation government in northern Quebec in the creation of a new protected areas network. So it was pretty exciting and innovative stuff, and I was thrilled to get to learn about it and happy to share it with you today. So um, from what I understand, it was all about creating the relationship and building the relationship and building the trust um, in the top right corner in the middle is my colleague, uh, Christy McDonald. 
who I know uh, was a central part of this project and explained that it took many years to to work through and to um, grow relationships and to um, build that trust where NCC could kind of be at the table and an important part of this of this planning initiative that was eventually um, a really awesome success. Wait till you see the map. I'm, I think it's so cool. So the timeline for this one um, was in 2012. The Cree Nation government in the EUHG area released the Cree Regional Conservation Strategy that was then finalized in 2014. And in 2015, the Cree Nation government partnered up with NCC to advance um, some of the goals, knowing that NCC had some interesting conservation data, sort of that Western science data, and the ability to perform these really like detailed, dorky, exciting, <laughs> prioritization analysis with GIS, like across a landscape to help identify priorities. That's really, that's a, sort of the bread and butter of our work. And it is really cool and complex and we all love it. So um, definitely something we're always happy to bring to the table. And then I understand the Cree Nation government was meeting with the Quebec government and sort of reviewing some of the technical approaches and priorities in this planning exercise. And then for a period of two years, the Cree Nation government led a series of community meetings and interviews with land users and tallymen to document and map important Cree cultural and land use features within these track line areas uh, that made up the planning area uh, and the, the territory that was um, the planning was being done for. And then uh, an assessment of both um, scientific and cultural values were combined to then identify priority areas for conservation in the territory. So once again, the Cree Nation government was back with the Quebec government talking about how to sort of deliver these uh, proposed protected areas uh, to help everybody with our work towards meeting um, imperatives, which were, you know, at the time, 17% of lands protected by 2020, 25% by 2025, and 30% by 2030 now. And it was proposed um, that about 6.9 million hectares, which is like 17 million acres across EUHE be put forward for consideration um, to be established as reserves. And then um, I understand that the Cree Nation government and partners submitted to the federal government, uh, Environment Canada, for funding through the, the challenge funding uh, that would finalize the establishment of protected areas and include a guardians program for long term monitoring. So the outcome here was this crazy cool map where all the green areas were the existing protected areas in Quebec and all the red areas were what actually got through as like new protected areas. So they, in the end, totaled 3.9 million acres. So I think about half of what was originally proposed, but still, this is a staggering amount of land. And the category was territories reserved for the purpose of protected areas. So that's everything in red. And now combined with the green, the existing protected areas network, um, they cover 100,000 kilometers squared. I had to read that stat a few times, covering about 23% of the territory, which is just amazing. When you think about that's where we need to be for goals, at least 20, 30% of all of the lands protected uh, forever. And so in this, um, in these areas, I understand that um, no further industrial development is allowed, so forestry, mining, hydro, et cetera. And so, yeah, I'll wrap it there and really wanted to thank everybody for allowing me um, the honor of spending time with you and presenting to you today. Thank you for listening. Um, thank you for um, any thoughts you're able to provide. And thank you for the relationships we've built to date and those that I look forward to continuing cultivating. Um, for anyone watching online, I've got my contact information here. So it's kristen.ferguson at natureconservancy.ca. You can email me anytime. And that's my cell phone number for calls or texts. Uh, so yeah, kind of get the, the discussions rolling and see what amazing conservation opportunities are present in your territories and any ways that NCC might be able to help. And again, excited to engage about the Boreal Wildlands property, uh, really, or any other great conservation ideas anywhere in Ontario. Um, we're here to chat about them anytime. So thanks again for your time. Thanks so much, Kristen. I'm going to stop, <clears throat> excuse me, stop the recording. <laughs>